Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're very lucky to be joined uh, by Chris Fastnacht, who's come down to us from UC Davis today. Chris did uh, his BA at uh, Harvard in Physics and Astronomy, uh, and then he did uh, a, a stint in the Peace Corps uh, in Ghana, in Africa, before he went to uh, Caltech to do his PhD uh, on uh, gravitational lensing uh, uh, and uh, measurements uh, of the Hubble constant using gravitational lensing. He then did a, a postdoc as the Jansky Fellow at uh, the National Radio Astronomy uh, NRAO in New Mexico uh, and was Institute Fellow at, uh, uh, in Baltimore at the uh, Space Science uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. And then uh, he joined UC Davis after that. He's uh, interested in uh, such topics as uh, the, uh, su the substructure of uh, moderate road shift gal galaxies, uh, high resolution uh, radio imaging of active galactic nuclei, uh, the Hubble search for uh, strong lenses in, uh, in our sky, deep imaging uh, with strong lenses, and uh, he's also involved in the projects, uh, the uh, Cosmic Lens All Sky Survey, and he's the Davis PI for the astrophysics networks for, uh, for galaxy uh, lensing studies, uh, which is angles. So uh, Chris is going to talk to us about all those topics today. So uh, please, uh, please join me in welcoming Chris. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not going to actually talk about all those topics because <laughs> that would be rather long. Uh, but I'll talk to you about two of those. And um, both of them have to do with dark something or another. So I'm, I'm calling this exploring the dark side of the universe. So the first, uh, the motivation for this, and it's always good to think about the really big questions are driving the, the research uh, that we're doing. And in my case, I can... Uh, put it in these terms. So these are the really the big questions that underlie what I'm doing. That we're eventually trying to get at uh, one is what is dark energy? And you've probably heard of this. This is this mysterious thing that's causing the acceleration of the universe. To, the, sorry, the expansion of the universe to accelerate. Um, what is dark matter? And how do galaxies get put together? Okay, that's rather grandiose and and not specific enough to uh, to uh, write say a grant proposal. So let's look at more specific things. Um, one is to obtain measurements of cosmological parameters, including those that uh, describe dark energy, using a technique that's, that's different from sort of the standard techniques. Um, and another one is to look at how um, mass is distributed in galaxies. And in particular, as Adrian said, I'm looking at something called substructure, so little, little blobs of mass that are associated with big massive galaxies. And these two, these two projects are linked by the techniques that I use, the tools I use. Um, the first is gravitational <coughs> lensing, and then the second one is getting very high resolution imaging of these objects. And I'll show you some examples of that. So in this talk today, what I will do is I'll, I'll split it into roughly three parts. The first one, I'll go through gravitational lensing, uh, just in case uh, that's a new topic for you and show you how we can use lenses to measure, um, say, cosmological parameters. And then I'll talk about uh, the project to measure cosmological parameters with lenses, uh, including the dark energy. And then in the third part of the talk, I'll uh, talk about substructure, if there's time. And I'll show you some pretty pictures along the way. All right, so as I said, this is uh, my main tool is uh, gravitational lensing for studying these things. And it really is a tool. I mean, you can think about it as, as sort of a, its own special type of telescope in some ways. Um, but here, here's the basic idea, and this is all due to general relativity uh, as developed by Einstein. And uh, the idea is that if light, a, li a ray of light passes close by to a massive object, that ray of light is bent, even though it's massless. Um, and the amount that is bent, so you can see here uh, on this plot, I'm showing uh, light from a star. Okay, I'm not used to giving a two-screen talk. Uh, passing by a massive object, it gets bent through some angle alpha, and um, then comes into the observer here at Earth. And because the light gets bent as it passes by the sun, um, 
the observer will see the star, that distant object, not in this true location, but in a shifted location farther away from the sun. And the amount that the um, light gets bent was set by general relativity, and it depends on essentially two things. It depends on the mass of the object that's bending uh, the light. That's m here. I won't show very many equations. And then the distance of closest approach, b. So it's a stronger effect if the object is more massive or if the light ray passes closer to the object. And this was um, a big change because uh, in Newton's theories, if light were, were a massive particle, the cor it's called the corpuscular theory of light, then you would predict this bending angle to be half of what Einstein predicted it to be. And there's a famous uh, expedition um, to measure this angle using a solar eclipse back in the early 1900s. It's a uh, arc second, yeah, 1.7. Oh, I was thinking 1.73 or something. Yeah, I don't know why that's sticking in my head, but yes, it's around that. It's a, and actually, if you look, I've seen pictures of the actual data, and it's not, to my eye, at all conclusive. But um, it was hailed as a great triumph at the time, as I understand it, that it uh, validated Einstein's theory and uh, not the corpuscular theory of light. Um, all right, and one thing that we see is that. In addition to bending the light ray, as, as you have a sort of, a, if you consider a bundle of rays that are going by, each passes a slightly different distance from the object, and so it'll be bent by a slightly different amount. And the end result is that the image of the star, if you could resolve it, would be, would be uh, distorted and stretched in some ways. And I'll show you some examples of that. Okay, so the type of lens, there's, it turns out there's different types of lensing. You think that this is a really special, uh, specialized field, but we go to conferences and it splits up into at least three different subfields. Um, and the, the subfield that I'm, I do most of my work in is something called strong lensing. And this is where you have the object that's, the bright distant object, the object that's bending the, the light, and you are almost in a perfect line. And in that case, there are, can be more than one path around the massive object that comes into you, that sort of gets focused into you. And in that case, you see more than one image of the background object. It's called multiple imaging or strong lensing. And this cartoon on the left uh, shows this in a sort of cartoony way. So this is light coming from some distant object. It's going around the left side being bent, around the right side being bent. Those, those rays come into uh, the observer, and the observer sees um, two images of the background object. And um, I'm going to show this picture. This is Fritz Zwicky, who is a famous astronomer. And um, a lot of times people see, um, at least the talks I've been to, people show this picture of Zwicky. It, it, everyone loves this picture. And they show it because Zwicky was, a, was uh, one of the first people to postulate dark matter um, by looking at the motions of galaxies in, in clusters, in massive clusters of galaxies. But he was also extremely ahead of his time in predicting that um, you'd be able to observe this effect. So Einstein realized that you could have this multiple imaging effect, but it turns out that, um, and this is this, what I'm trying to emphasize in the box at the bottom here, that the mass of the lensing object sets how far those two images are apart in the sky in an angular sense. And so Einstein, when he was thinking about this, was thinking about stars acting as the lensing object, the object that bends the light. And they said, and he, he realized that with stars, the angular separation of those images would be, say, milli arc seconds. And so you wouldn't be able to observe that, he thought, with the technology. Um, that was around at the time, and maybe even, not even now. What Zwicky did in the mid-1930s, he realized galaxies are much, much more massive than stars. And therefore, if you had a distant bright object behind a galaxy, the images would be split by, say, an arc second. And you might be, actually be able to observe this. So he made this prediction in, um, like I said, the mid-30s. And it wasn't until the late 70s that this was actually shown. This is a case where theory was way, way ahead of, uh, of observation. Yes? Are there any phase relations what you expect from path length? Um, yeah, I don't think we really look at the phase so much. Um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so here we have this in practice. Um, 
And so the top uh, left image is actually the first lens that was discovered. Uh, it's a very famous lens. It's called a double quasar. And so you have um, two images of a very uh, bright, distant object called a quasar. And if you look carefully, sort of closer to the bottom image, there's an extra little fuzz. That's the galaxy that's acting as the lens that's bending the light. And it turns out that this was discovered first because the galaxy that's bending the light, that's acting as the main lens, is sitting in a cluster of galaxies. And so there's an additional amount of mass there that splits the images by even farther. So in fact, the separation between these two images is about six arc seconds, which makes it easy to observe. Um, now uh, lenses, people are, are doing dedicated searches for lenses in lots of ways, and we found a lot more. Um, a typical massive galaxy acting as a lens will split the images by about an arc second. That's, that's sort of the rule of thumb. And so um, most of the images, I think all the images I'm going to show you from now on, they'll be roughly an arc second across. Um, there, there are some very typical configurations of images that you see. Um, either you see two images of the background object, as you see in that top left case. Uh, you can see four images. That's also very typical, as you see in the top middle. Or if you have essentially perfect alignment between you, the lens, and the background object, you have a ring. It's called an Einstein ring because every path you know, can get bent into you and you get a little ring. And so this is what you're seeing in this top right case. So you see it looks like a little bullseye. The, the bright thing in the center is the lens and galaxy. And the ring is a background galaxy that's been lens, stretched out, distorted in, into a ring. Um, I show two more lenses down at the bottom because they're my two favorite lenses. Um, you'll actually see uh, the one on the bottom left again. Yes? How large is the lens and galaxy in this image? The, um, well, I know that this top, you mean in arc seconds, say? Well, no, on that, on that picture, it's near the top. I would have it was a large object all along the way. In all the images, this sort of blob here in the center is the lens and galaxy. The bright blob, the bright blob in the center is the lens and galaxy. Yes, so you can see it very clearly. Um, from the ground, this is much harder. So um, these, at least these top two images are taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, because it, it's, once again, you can, you can set the scale. These are about an arc second across. This one's actually half an arc second across. And so from the ground with uh, atmospheric blurring, um, a lot of this sort of is, is, is hard to detect. All right. Um, so what I like to do is, I mean, when my project, the project that I was doing for my thesis, and then it sort of went on hiatus for a while, and then it's come back because we've gotten more sophisticated, um, is basically using lenses to measure cosmological parameters, including sort of the, the, the biggest effect is measuring the distance scale in the universe. And I have a little analogy here, um, which I like. So imagine it's a little contrived, but it actually does a decent job. Um, all analogies break down at some level, but th this is actually pretty good. So imagine we have a map of California. You have a map of California, but that little scale bar at the bottom that tells you how many uh, miles per inch or kilometers per centimeter or whatever has been ripped off. So you have no idea what the scale of this map is. Um, but what you can do is say, OK, if I look at the map, down here at the bottom, say that's LA. Up here, we have the SETI Institute. And um, if you look carefully, this is. Sorry, this is my poor drawing. It's very light. But I've drawn two sort of wiggly uh, roots along there. One can be 101, and one can be I-5 through the Central Valley. And what you can do with this map is you could lay a string down along each of those roots and measure what the ratio of the lengths is. So you can say, OK, OK, I'm just picking things out of a hat here. But you could say that the route along I-5 is, say, 10% longer than the route along uh, 101. And that's going to be true. OK, that may not have been the correct sense, but, let, but just go, go with it here. OK, so th th and that's going to be true no matter what the scale is, no matter how many miles it is. That will always be longer by 10% than the other one. OK, that gives you some bit of information. Then what you do is you, to, to figure out what the scale is, let's say you have two friends that live in Los Angeles. You call them up and you say, OK, I want you to both come visit me. You leave at exactly the same time. One of you drives along I-5. One of you drives along 101. Don't tell me when you're leaving. I'll just wait for you to come here. And the other thing is, you both have to drive exactly 60 miles an hour the whole way. So, OK, ignoring practicalities about whether this is possible, 
Um, well, all you do is you wait, and let's say that your friend who drove, drove along uh, 101, which I claimed was a shorter route, arrives an hour before the other one. Then you know that the diff, because you know how fast they were going, 60 miles an hour, you know that the difference in the path length is 60 miles. And so essentially this is then, oops, uh, this is two problems in, in two unknowns. So you have the ratio of A to B, say is 10% longer, and now you have the absolute difference a minus B, and you can solve for the scale. All right, and that's the basic idea with lensing, with strong lensing. So here's my cartoon of lensing. Um, so here on the far left, we have this thing labeled S, uh, which is the background object, say the quasar. You're over here on the right-hand side, and these dark lines represent the paths that uh, the light takes to get to you. So they travel along. They pass close by this lensing object, that's the L thing here, that's my cartoon of a galaxy, and they get bent by some angle, and um, what you can do then is, in, in almost all cases, except for perfect Einstein rings, almost every other case, the time that takes light to travel along these two paths is different. Um, so what you do is you make a model of the system, and that allows you to essentially, I guess this is where the analogy breaks down a little bit, but essentially it allows you to, to, to break the, what the ratio is uh, between the path lengths. So say one is 10% longer. And then what you have to do is measure what we call the time delay. So this is like your friend. So something happens in the lens, let's say it gets suddenly twice as bright as it was before. That information goes out through the universe at the speed of light, so you know the speed that's traveling. And in particular it goes along these two paths to come to you, and then you just look at the lens over and over again, and at some point, one of the images will double in brightness. At some point later, the other image will double in brightness, and then you'll say, okay, that's the difference in, in the light travel times. Now, I've my two equations and two unknowns, I solve for the scaling factor. In this case, with the universe, uh, the scale factor is called the Hubble constant, uh, which allows us to convert uh, redshifts into distances. Uh, and so that's the basic idea there. Okay, so, um, Slightly more, uh, more technically, um, this is one thing, this is uh, just the same cartoon again, and ex explains sort of what, what happens here. So in the absence of a lens, light would travel along this red line from the background object to you. Um, but you introduce the lens, the massive uh, lensing object in between you and, and the background object. And what that tends to do is it introduces penalties um, in the time that it, uh, light takes to reach you. I, I liken this to, because um, this is something that happened to me. When I was in college, I ran cross country, and one time uh, the we ran the course right after a big rain, and there was an enormous puddle lying right across where the course went through. And so if you imagine that the puddle was actually fairly deep, which it was reasonably deep, you can imagine that running straight through the puddle introduces some kind of penalty because you're running through the water, it slows you down. Um, so to compensate, you might go around the, pu the puddle, but of course if that's a long way, that's a penalty as well, because you're running a longer distance. And so there's some optimal path, sort of partially through the puddle, um, that, that gives you the shortest time. And that's exactly what light does. There's a penalty introduced, it's, it's called the, it's a gravitational, a general relativistic um, delay that's introduced by going through the gravitational potential of the lens. Um, and that's the, like running through the water. And then there's a geometric delay from going around the outside. And the, the real rays, these black lines are set by where those two um, sort of balance out to give you, OK, officially it's, it's an extremum of the light travel time. You can think about it as a minimum of light travel time. So the shortest times are taken by those two paths. And so if you look at the, okay, the travel time along one of these deflected paths, one of the black lines, OK, this is not really working. Um, compared to the red line, it has two components. Like I say, there's what we call the geometrical component, the time penalty from going around the galaxy, and then there's the gravitational penalty, time delay, that, goes, that comes from going through the, through the gravitational potential. And we can write it in this, um, in this way on the second line here, that the time delay, delta t, depends on some, some constant times, well, a bunch of things. The, 
All right. We'll, we'll, so the geometrical delay is, depends on the difference uh, between the angular position, the true angular position of the object, which is this angle beta, and the angular position of the, um, say, the image that you see. So that's beta in that case. Um, beta, the true angular position of the object, is not observable. So that has to come into your model. And then this psi term here, the second term in the square brackets, is uh, the gra a, a version of the gravitational potential. And so that's your penalty from going through the gravitational potential. And then what's important for cosmology is this term out here. Uh, there's this d delta t. And this d delta t depends, in turn, on uh, a ratio of these three distances in, in, the, in the system. So there's a distance between you and the lensing object, which I call dl, the distance between you and the background object, which I call ds, and then the distance between the lensing object and the background object, dls. And um, if you can measure the time delays, and if you can measure, do the modeling, then that gives you this d delta t. And the important thing is that, okay, so this is sort of rearranging that equation. So d delta t is what you care about. You measure that if you can measure the time delays and do your model correctly. And the important thing is sort of down here in the bottom thing is that this d delta t includes cosmological parameters, including uh, the Hubble constant, which is the thing that's most sensitive to, so h not the Hubble constant. But it turns out that it's also sensitive to things like the matter density in the universe and the dark energy uh, terms. And like, that's these last two terms, omega sub lambda and w, describe this dark energy, this mysterious thing that uh, causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And when I started out doing this in the 90s, it was nice because we said, OK, the, de the dependence is almost entirely on the Hubble constant. This d delta t is proportional to 1 over the Hubble constant. So there's a, big, there's a strong dependence there. And it barely depends on these other things here. So even if we're off in, in what our model of the universe is, we'll still get a good measurement of the Hubble constant. But it turns out now, if you combine this data set with other data sets, and the modeling has gotten so good, and our data have gotten so good, that we actually can probe these subtle effects that are due to the dark energy parameters. And that's, um, that's what makes this fun. OK, um, just one more way of thinking about this. Um, this is sort of like uh, my cartoon of the state of California again. So the time delay distance is, is, depends, is proportional to the time delay. And it's proportional to 1 over the Hubble constant. So if you have a small time delay, it means because um, what you measure is the angles. And so what the time delay gives you is essentially the scale of the map. And so if the time delay is small for a given angle, that means the Hubble constant is large, and hence the distances are small. Or conversely, if the time delay is large, that means the Hubble constant is small, and the distances are large. And so that, that's the basic idea. So um, when we look out, we see everything in terms of angles, and the time delay is what allows us to convert those angles into physical sizes. OK, so um, they call this lensing. It's gravitational lensing, but they call it lensing because it, it acts as like a lens. You can think about it in terms of a piece of glass. And so um, it turns out that there is a, a good analogy for this. So here's my cartoon out of sort of the lens I'm, I was going to say most familiar with, but since I'm wearing some lenses on my face, maybe second most familiar with. Uh, this is just a magnifying glass. And so the red lines represent light coming in from the left, being focused to a point by the magnifying glass. And you can set fires and do all sorts of fun stuff with that. Um, this is not how gravitational lensing uh, affects light. To have a lens that sort of mimicked, uh, have a glass lens that mimics gravitational lensing, it would have to have a cross section something like this. Um, and this is not so common. Um, and uh, what, actually, when I was in grad school, a couple of the senior people, like the pundits in this field, actually went to their local machine shops and had, um, had pieces of glass custom made that had roughly this profile. And so they could you know, shine a laser through it and show the lensing effect. It was very cool. Yeah, is this what mimics the 1 over B term? It, it sort of it mimics both things because you have a thick glass, you know, if, if we have light coming in from the left, say, um, going straight through the center introduces a huge penalty because you have a long path length through the, the glass. And then going, yeah. Um, all right, so um, I thought, well, I'm never going to see something like this. 
it, um, unless I have, have it custom made. But my friend Phil Marshall, who was at, uh, just up the road at Kaipak at Stanford for a long time, he's now at Oxford, made a very uh, clever realization, something that I should have realized given where we are, which is that there is a piece of glass that we encounter all the time that has a, has a cross section that's pretty close to this, and that's a wine glass. <laughs> And so you can actually mimic gravitational lensing with the wine glass. So here you have some light source, the candle. And if you tilt the, the wine glass the right way, you can get um, four images. So the top right, so it's one, two, three, and then there's sort of a fourth one hidden over here. Two images for an Einstein ring. Yeah. So I like to say you can impress people at parties with this. But um, it, it, it's, it's, it's more impressive if you empty the wine glass before you try to show this effect. <laughs> yeah. OK. So that's, that's sort of the, you know, what is the lens and how we use it to measure cosmology. So now I'm going to talk to you um, sort of more specifically about uh, some of the projects that we're doing. And this is the first one, cosmological parameters. And um, the motivation is, is just that we really want to understand um, you know, how the, our universe works. And there's, there's a fairly small number of parameters, at least in the model that we have, that describe the universe as a whole. One is the Hubble constant. Um, but of course, the most exciting one is, is dark energy, or the parameters that describe dark energy. And um, as you, I'm sure you know, um, the Nobel Prize in physics this past year went to the supernova people who originally discovered that the expansion of the universe is, is accelerating. And in fact, uh, Adam Reese, who was one of the people uh, who got that uh, Nobel Prize, is talking at Berkeley today at five. He's giving a public talk. So, um, yes. So um, another another experiment that you may have heard a lot about is is things that look at the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, and in particular the the well the there's one up now called Planck that's that's looking at the cosmic microwave background. The previous one was called WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave and isotropy probe. And there was a big splash when, when um, those data came out from WMAP. And they claimed to measure the Hubble constant at fairly high accuracy. Um, but it turns out that in order to make this, the, from the cosmic microwave background alone, you can't actually constrain what the Hubble constant is. You have to make an additional assumption or combine it with an additional data set. And um, that's what this sort of strange plot at the bottom left is supposed to show you. Um, so this shows um, some parameters that, that describe uh, the universe. So we have omega matter, which is the, matter, the um, density in matter, the energy density in matter. Um, on the vertical axis, omega lambda, that's the dark energy density. And then the colored points represent sort of solutions that are, are compatible with the WMAP data. And all those points uh, are spread out along this line. And the color coding of the line tells you what value of the Hubble constant is associated with those. And you, you can't see this from the back, but that range when the sort of the cyan colored uh, at the bottom is around, uh, is less than 40. And up at the top, it's around 100, I believe. Um, and this is a, a huge range on the Hubble constant. And we who study uh, cosmology like to say we're entering the era of precision cosmology because it sounds sexy and helps us get grants. Um, but you know, having the Hubble constant, which is is you know people have been studying since Hubble in the uh, in the early 1900s, you know, ranging from 30 to 100 um, is is not is not really precision cosmology. Um, so what what they've done is, is is this may be very hard to see from the back, but there's a white line diagonal white line going through there that represents um, sort of goes like this, um, and that represents uh, solutions where the universe is flat. So there's uh, the overall curvature of the universe is flat, and if if you assume the universe is flat, then that restricts you to a region up here near the top of this long colored line, and then you can get very precise. Um, uh, determinations of the Hubble constant from the CMB data. Okay, and that's a that's a reasonable assumption, but it's an assumption that they have to make. It doesn't come from the data themselves. Um, there are other reasons for studying um, uh, the Hubble constant and combining the Hubble constant with with uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background. And 
Um, just to look at this top plot here on the left. So on the top plot, one of the parameters that describes the dark energy is this parameter W, which we call the equation of state parameter. Um, and once again, this is something that we really want to, to measure well. And if we just focus in the, on this outer contour here, the outer set of contours, these light blue or cyan contours, those are the, the, the contours that you get from the W map data in terms of uh, the Hubble constant along the x-axis and W along the y-axis. And it's a big, long banana uh, shape. And what Adam Reese has shown is that if you can make a high precision measurement of the Hubble constant, then you limit the, the sort of the horizontal range that's allowed. And therefore, you get a much more precise measurement of the dark energy parameters also. And that's this inner sort of blue, darker blue and purple contours here. So this is something that he's working on. And I'm sure it's something he's going to be talking about um, in his talk today. So he's really made a huge advance in this, in measuring the dark energy parameters, by measuring very pr precisely what the Hubble constant is um, today, and then um, combining it with the, the data from the cosmic microwave background. OK, so why do I do this? Um, because, so here's my, my motivation, is that uh, you know, in order to really nail down these important parameters, you don't want to just trust one method. Uh, you want to make several independent measurements of it. And especially since there are probably systematic errors that can affect each of the, the different methods. Um, and uh, so what we want to do is try it in several different ways. And the nice thing about uh, lensing is that it's completely separate from the traditional um, distance ladder methods that, say, Adam Reese uses. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really nice. Um, the interesting thing here um, is that if you want to really make your, your, your method look good, so you compare the size of the contours. This is what people do. They draw these contours and they show, look at here, they're big, and then we do our thing, and, the, and they get small. Um, it, it, the big jump between the big contours from the cosmic microwave background alone and you know, your improved thing comes in whatever first data set that you combine with, with the cosmic microwave background data. So for Adam, he uses his supernova data and his Cepheid data um, to get these very tight contours. And then everything else is sort of an incremental improvement on that. But you know, if you want to spin your own favorite method, you just combine your method first with the CMB method, and then you look really good. And so that's what we're, we're trying to do, too. Um, all right, just to show you again, so lensing, lensing works for this. OK, so let's look at it in practice. This is my favorite lens coming up again. Um, and uh, I started out my, my astronomy career as a radio astronomer. I guess, well, I was an x-ray astronomer first when I was an undergraduate, then a radio astronomer. So here is my favorite lens again. This is a map of it at the top left. It's made with a radio telescope, in this case, the VLA. Um, and what you see is there's four images, A, B, C, and D. Um, and these are all images of the background object, which is a radio loud active galactic nucleus. You do not see the lens and galaxy in this picture because the lens and galaxy does not have strong enough radio emission for, to be picked up. This is a 30 second snapshot of the, uh, of the image, of the lens system. And so um, the nice thing is, all right, I'm, I might have lied. That might be a three or four minute. But in any case, um, it's a very short exposure on this system. And so the nice thing is, is you detect only the lensed uh, AGN images. And so what the VLA has really nice angular resolution. This is about two arc seconds across. And so what I, I did is I, I look at this system every sort of roughly every three days, measure how bright each one of those components was. And um, you can construct what we call light curves. So we have uh, these plots here, time going along the x-axis, and uh, essentially the flux, the brightness of the images on the y-axis. And what you can see is that um, essentially um, you start out roughly flat, time goes along, and then there's a sort of a sudden jump, and then it sort of continues roughly flat again. And you see this pattern happen in at least the top three pretty clearly. The bottom one is hard, harder to see. The bottom one is from image D, which is the faintest of the components. And so the noise uh, on those measurements is larger. It is actually there. And I've drawn helpful vertical lines to guide the eye to, so you can see where this happened. I will say that um, this is eight months worth of monitoring every three days. Um, this was the third time I tried this on this. Um, 
I actually measured the time delays with the first season, first eight months, but this, these, these curves represent a jump of about 20% in the flux. The first season was about 5%. Um, and it wasn't a nice step function, it was sort of a little wiggle. Um, so this, this, these curves allowed me to get much more precise measurements. The second season was, oh, was a disaster. Yes? Well, what we do to determine... The autocorrelation is tough. I mean, to get the time delays, we use a cross-correlation. Um, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, so we use the, the cross-correlation, but you, you need, I mean, we cross-correlate the, the light curves. Yeah, yes. Yes, that's exactly right. So we, we do a cross-correlation. Um, there's several different techniques. This is, there's a long and sordid history of, of making this measurement from gravitational lenses. So the first lens that was discovered, people, uh, so he, another case of theory going ahead of the observation. So this method for using lenses to measure the Hubble constant was developed by Schur Restall in the 60s, once again, 15 years before we actually discovered a lens. So we, this first lens was discovered, people jumped on it, they spent all this effort, and it turned out that it was very complicated because it didn't vary by a whole lot, and the period of the time delay between the two images was like a year and a half. And there were these weird aliasing effects between when the object went behind the sun and there were these gaps in the light curve and some very, very smart people got the wrong answer and um, it looked really bad for all of us. And then in the, in the that was sort of in the 80s, in the 90s, um, the modeling, which is of how the mass is distributed, was done in a sort of unsophisticated way and, and we would get, we had better time delays but we had worse models and so someone would get, oh, the Hubble constant is 80 plus or minus 2. And someone would say, no, it's 45 plus or minus 4. And we look really bad. We're finally, we, we have our act together now. But um, we have, a, we're, we're, yeah, we're finding bad history. So people don't believe it. But now we have our act together. All right. Um, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. But um, let me say, there's, so there's lots of techniques to use. Cross-correlation is one of them. Um, and... Um, in the end, when you measure the time delays, the, the true test is if you take the light curves and slide them along each other. And back when I started this game, people were still using view graph machines to give talks. And so they would bring them up, and they would actually slide them along each other and reach a point where everyone, in theory, would go, oh. Um, I heard this backfired for one of the pundits in this field. But in any case, if, if I were to do that, this is what the four light curves look like when they're scale shifted by their proper amount. And you see that they do all show this nice jump at the same point, and if you look carefully, even some of the little wiggles seem to be reproduced. And so this is actually a fairly uh, precise measurement of the, of the time delays in the system. So that's one of the ingredients. Um, another one, so there, there are the actual numbers if you care. Um, the, this modeling problem that I talked about is it turns out that there's a degeneracy when you do the lens model. So lenses are great because the they tell you extremely accurately what the mass is inside the sort of Einstein ring. So this is an optical image of this system taken with the, with the HST. And you see the four images again, A, B, C, D. And then you see a sort of a ring. There's two lens and galaxies, a little bit of a mess. But lensing gets you very accurately what the mass is inside of that. Remember I said the mass tells you what the separation of the images is. Um, and it doesn't really care how that mass is distributed within that ring which is great if you care about the mass, but it's horrible if you care about how the mass is distributed. And it turns out the steepness of the density profile is completely degenerate with the Hubble constant. So if the, uh, if the profile is steeper, the Hubble constant that you get out for the same time delays is larger, and vice versa. And you have no constraint on that if you just have the four images that I showed you before. And this is why we had problems in the 90s. As everyone said, OK, we assume that the density follows a very specific profile. We're going to fix it at that value. And then we get these models, and you know the statistical errors on those models were tiny, but they weren't allowing the, the steepness to vary at all. And so that's why people get these wildly discrepant values. It turns out that if you have high angular resolution imaging, and you can resolve the ring, essentially the, the way that the thickness of the ring varies as it goes around tells you sort of how steep the mass profile is. And so finally, we're able to break that degeneracy. But you need high angular resolution imaging. 
uh, with good signal to noise. Um, it helps also if you can measure the stellar velocity dispersion of the galaxy, uh, but I'm not going to point that out. So um, it turns out that um, if we use that one system, my favorite lens, uh, do good models on it, use the high precision time glaze, and combine with the CMB data, we actually get really nice improvements in uh, constraints on, say, the Hubble constant and dark energy compared to just WMAP data alone. So I had a couple slides up here. Actually, in, in the other plot, it, it showed maybe more uh, impressive improvement. But what you want to look at is just the red contours compared to the black contours. It's not, uh, like I say, this one's not as impressive as maybe the Adam Reese one, but we're getting values. Um, so here's the Hubble constant. So it's about 70 plus or minus 5. And uh, W, which we expect to be around minus 1 if Einstein's theory is correct, we get to sort of 20%. But the nice thing about this for us is that this is one lens. So we've only looked at one lens combined with the, the CMB. And we're already getting um, values. OK, tables. I hate tables and talks. Uh, so I apologize. But so we're getting a 7%. This bottom line here shows you what we're doing with one lens and the CMB data. We're getting a 7% measurement on the Hubble constant and an 18% measurement on the um, on W. And if you look at uh, the second line here is the, the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project that used tons of orbits of, of HST time. And we're doing better than they are um, on both parameters. And we're doing almost as well as, OK, this is an old Adam Reese paper. He's now come out with a better one. So we're doing not quite as well as that, but also, once again, a much bigger program. And the beautiful thing is that, um, yeah, it, it's you can do each lens is independent. Um, and so we can use each lens to test, make these measurements in an independent way, as opposed to, say, the supernova samples, where all of them are so noisy that you have to put them together in one big sample. Um, and that gives us some strength as well. So I, I just want to say, OK, um, as I'm probably going to speed up a little bit, I just want to say that we're not claiming this is better than the other methods, but it's different, it's independent, and it gives us a check on the stuff that, say, Adam Reese was doing. And that's nice. Here's our second data set. Uh, we, this is, there's only two lenses so far that have all of the full data that we need to do this. Uh, this one is the second one. Um, and I'm going to skip over this slide. Um, and just to show that we're getting nice constraints here. Um, and the, actually, the beautiful things is that, OK, this is uh, very quickly, the, the dashed blue lines here, which you can probably barely see from the back, those are uh, with the supernova data. And then the black lines are our data. And the fact that those contours are sort of have different angles allows you to combine those two data sets and get even better constraints on these parameters. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, one of the, one of the um, cute things that we did for the second lens is we did the analysis blind. So we didn't know what the value was until the very end of the, say, the Hubble constant. So we did the, the analysis, and it just produced a range. And when we were happy, we thought we had all the errors under control. We turned off the blinding. We saw what the value was. And we, public, we said we were going to publish that no matter what it was. And luckily, it was, it was in the range that we had hoped it would be. But we were trying to avoid, uh, avoid bias biasing the results. Um, this plot just shows that for different parameters, lensing does about as well as uh, the other methods. OK, I'm going to skip over this slide. Oh, no, I won't. OK, lots of big surveys are coming out in the future. PANS are happening now. PANSTAR is a dark energy survey. Euclid, LSST, they're going to give us tons of time delay systems, thousands. And so because each lens is in independent, we're really going to be able to get some nice constraints from lensing. Um, once again, I don't think we're going to beat any of the other methods, but we'll be roughly about the same as they are. And um, yeah, I think it'll be, it'll, it'll be nice. OK, so the takeaway message for this part of the talk is just that with a small sample of lenses, you can do make interesting measurements of these cosmological parameters with precisions that are comparable to other approaches. They're independent, and uh, I didn't talk about the last one, but they contain internal checks for systematics. Yes? Shortest time delay in um, those systems. The one, my favorite one, um, 
time delay was, well, there's a four day time delay, or four or five days, but if I start, if I measure them all with respect to the image that varies first, it's sort of 30 days, 35 days, and 75 days, roughly. So um, it's, it's measurable in a, in, a, in a grad student lifetime. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to blow through some of this, um, um, but that's okay. I'll show you some pretty pictures. Um, so dark, looking at dark matters, okay, here, here, here is the takeaway message. So, so I thought I might be running out of time, so I'll give you the takeaway messages first. If you have a red system and you look at it with ground-based adaptive optics imaging, you can get better, sharper images than the Hubble Space Telescope. That's pretty cool. I'll show you an example of that. And this is great for looking at substructure detection, which is what I'm going to talk about um, now. And it's good for the other things too, but I'm not going to talk about those. So substructure in theory. So when people make models of how, how, how things form in the universe, galaxies and clusters, they see that they look roughly the same in their models. These are computer simulations. On the left, we have a cluster. On the right, we have a galaxy. In each case, you see one big sort of central halo, they're called, and then all these little blobs, subhalos or substructures around them. So this is what the theory says galaxies and clusters should look like. This is what it looks like in practice. So the cluster looks sort of like the simulation. You have lots of little things that are all orbiting around the central part. The galaxy, not so much. So we're missing a bunch of these little blobs. Where are they all? And in particular, this is just a very cartoony view of the um, Milky Way, the, sorry, the local group. So we have Milky Way, Andromeda, Triangulum, and then these little things uh, marked are the, the um, dwarf satellites that we know about. And there are 20 or so, 30, not the thousands that we expect. Um, and so um, what we expect, so on the top is a simulation going on. OK, my computer is dying because it's, uh, but this is a simulation of a galaxy like the Milky Way forming. This is showing the dark matter. And you just see thousands and thousands of, of little blobs. And we can predict, um, if we plot, the, the mass of the blob versus the number of that, that have that mass, all the simulations predict essentially what the red line is in this bottom plot here. So it's roughly a power law. Um, and um, the simulations will predict what the slope of that power law is, which we call alpha, and its normalization, uh, which I'll call F sub. And in the Milky Way, if we, and people look very, very hard and done a very good job, um, they see this block line here that we just aren't seeing all of these small mass galaxies that we we would we would expect, and so there are several explanations. I've listed three here. One is that the substructures are there, but we just can't see them. Maybe they never formed stars. Maybe they formed like a couple stars and they blew up in a supernova and blew out all the gas. There's no more gas to make other stars. Um, okay, that's 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 reasonably interesting. Um, the second one is really interesting. Maybe there's something about dark matter. Um, that's different from what the simulations assume, and we don't get structure formation on these small scales. Um, and then perhaps the least interesting of one of these is that the Milky Way is just some kind of outlier. Um, you know, these are sort of average, average galaxies. Maybe the Milky Way is special in some way um, and just doesn't have uh, these, these galaxies. So we need better statistics. hypotheses I mentioned, we need a way to detect substructure alarm, lots of galaxies, in order to build up statistics. And we need a way to detect substructure even if it's completely dark. Because maybe the Milky Way even has lots of dark uh, substructure, um, but we just can't see it. And we need to wait, a way to measure the masses of those substructures. So lensing is great for this. Um, it works for galaxies that are even way far away. Um, it can detect purely dark things. And it measures the masses of these substructures. So I'm going to go through this quickly. I'm going to get to the, I'll sort of skip through, uh, I'll show you the pretty pictures because that's the important bit. Um, and then I'll, I'll mention briefly some of the, the results that we're getting. So I want you to think about the wine glass again. You look at that ring. So the wine glass tells, sort of defines how that ring of light is. Of the ring. And that's exactly the way that what lensing uh, 
works too. So we assume first that the lensing in the galaxy is distributed just a smooth mass profile, and then we start adding little lumps into it, and that can distort, distort the ring. Um, and the nice thing is, is that you don't have to be able to see those substructures to see the distortions that they cause, because they're just due to a gravitational effect. And so this is a, an example in real life of this happening. This is for a galaxy group. So the galaxy group is the main lens, and it has some overall mass distribution. And its lensing is beautiful, long blue arc here. This is a background galaxy that's been really distorted. Um, and if you look carefully, um, down here, there's something odd going on in the ring. Um, and if I zoom in on that, uh, it's, there's a little uh, yellow blob there. I should have said that these three yellow blobs in the center are the galaxies that are in this galaxy group that's acting as the lens. Um, and so there's this little yellow blob here. And, but look what happens to the ring. It comes down, there's a gap, and then it sort of splits. There's another little gap here, and then it continues on its merry way. And the point here is that we would know that there is some mass there, even if we didn't see the yellow blob, just because of the way that the ring is, is broken up there. And by measuring that splitting, say, between these two sides of the, the blue arcs here, we know what the mass of that little blob was. So we can detect if it's dark, and we can measure its mass. That's really cool. Does this work for galaxies? Yes, we've done simulations. Um, and this is my colleague, Simona Vegetti. Um, and she put down, um, made faint galaxies. She put in substructures and saw if she could detect them. What you see here, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to show you a few pictures later on. Um, so, that, so she subtracted the galaxy that's acting as the lens. So you don't see that there. You just see the ring. And then she adds in the substructures. And in the end, she, she makes what's called a convergence map, which tells you, OK, do you need extra mass somewhere? And where you see these little red blobs, um, you do need it. And so she found that you can detect little substructures down to 10 to the 8 solar masses near the ring, which is pretty impressive. OK, I'm going to skip over this stuff. It just tells you how we're doing it. Um, so we're doing, of course, all projects need to have a cute acronym. Ours is SHARP, um, Strong Lensing High Angular Resolution Program. It's not nearly as contrived as some other um, ones. Um, and it's small. It's a small group. That was all of us. There's six of us, maybe seven. And our new approach is to use Keck Adaptive Optics to do the imaging, get high-resolution imaging. And this is really good for um, red objects because you can, with adaptive optics, you can essentially correct for the, the, the um, atmosphere turbulence. And then you have the diffraction limit of the mirror, which goes as lambda over d. So um, d is 10 meters as opposed to the 2.5 meters of HST, which allows us to get better images, at least at the red end. Um, all right, so let's see this in practice. Um, these are the pretty pictures. So here we have, uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures. Here, so the top row is three images taken of a lens system with the Hubble Space Telescope. These are the three different bands. So there's three filters here. So we have uh, 555W, which is essentially V band, visual, 814W, that's I band, and F160W, that's H band in the near infrared. Um, in the bottom left is that F160W image again, just bigger. And then if you look at the Keck Adaptive Optics image, so that system. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Um, this is um, this scale bar here is half an arc second, uh, this white line here. And so here we, we see the system for the first time we detect. It's very faint, but the lens and galaxy is sitting right here. Pretty nice. All right, I have to show you a bunch more. OK, I won't do the, the quick reveal. So here they are. And you can see in all these cases, the adaptive optics image is sharper um, than the than the HST imaging. So th these are in K-band, uh, so it's 2.2 microns. Yeah. Um, and H-band is 1.6 microns, so it's not quite apples to apples. In theory, the Keck also does H-band imaging, um, and, and we actually have H-band data, but it should give you sharper images, but the, it's harder to correct the atmosphere as you go to shorter wavelengths, and so you actually lose some in signal to noise. Um, so if you, this is the last system I'm going to show you again quickly. So this is the, the, the um, in practice, detecting a substructure. 
So this is just another view of that image. We have the, the color is the adaptive optics image in the K-band again. The contours, this thing is also a radio loud lens, so those are the radio contours there. And when we did our analysis, um, so the top left here, oh boy, the top left is the, uh, are the data with the, the lens and galaxy subtracted. Um, the top middle is the model. Top right is the image residuals. And then just skip right down to the bottom right. That's the convergence. It shows the extra mass that's needed to get the model to agree with the data. And you see a little blob um, there. And its mass is around 2 times 10 to the 8th um, solar masses. This is not, I should have said when I showed you that galaxy group, remember the larger the mass is, the more the images are split. In the galaxy group, we could see the image splitting with our eyes because the thing that was doing the, the, the substructure in that case was actually a little galaxy, like 10 to the 10th solar masses. Here we're talking about much smaller things, so we don't actually see this with our eyes, but you know, the, the model requires, requires this. Uh, we detect this at three independent data, data sets. So this is adaptive optics K-band, 2.2 microns, H-band, 1.6 microns, and even in the HST image, um, we, we detect it at the H-band as well. So, okay, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly. So um, everyone is now does this Bayesian statistics. If you believe this, um, the, this is a 12 sigma detection between requiring this little blob and not requiring it. If you don't have it in, um, your model is much worse. Um, they all give sort of the same around 10 to the 8th solar masses. Um, this is the only other substructure that's been detected this way was with the Hubble Space Telescope, and that was 20 times more massive than this one. So the adaptive optics really does seem to help us. And basically it's because with sharper imaging, you can detect sort of more subtle perturbations to the ring. Um, but we're working with HST data as well. Okay, I'm just going to skip right to the, I'll show you this, this is kind of fun. This is a high resolution radio image, so we're going to try to see if we can detect um, the, the substructure also with the radio data. This is with VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry Telescopes in Europe and the US. Um, okay, we're publishing papers. Um, but what's the future? So we need better statistics. We're now up to three in some sense. We have the Milky Way and we have the two that I told you about. Uh, we want to get this about 20. We, we found if we can get it to around 20 to 30 lenses, then our measurements, our constraints on the slope and the normalization of that power law um, will give us interesting results. And we can, we can actually compare it to the simulations. That's what we want to do. So we're starting to actually directly compare it to these galaxy formation simulations. Um, long, so midterm, there's a proposal. If you can come up with um, several million dollars, um, to get what they call next generation adaptive optics on CAC, is it, which improves what's called the Strel ratio. So we get more of the light into that central diffraction limited core. Um, when you do this correction, you, you have some of the light in the, in the diffraction limited part and then more in the, sort of the seeing uh, part. So you have a sort of two Gaussians. Um, and the more light you can get into that central core, the better. Long term, once again, thousands of new lenses. And being at UC, I'm a big proponent of the TMT, the 30 meter telescope will give us even better angular resolution because it's a bigger telescope. And they will have to do adaptive optics on, on the TMT. So overall, and I apologize, I've run, oh no, that clock's fast. <laughs> OK, right, bang on time. OK, now I've run over. Um, high resolution imaging combined with strong lensing is great for doing both cosmological parameters and finding dark matter substructures. It's good for lots of other things too. Um, I think, and in both cases, we're really at the beginning steps of, of these techniques. We have a couple of systems in each case, and once you know, we get these big new surveys and better telescopes, we can get up to hundreds or thousands, and then we can really start making um, impressive uh, measurements. And I'll stop there. Chris, if I could uh, kick off the questions. Um, that, that substructure that you saw, uh, is that uh, is that really dark matter, or is it, could it just be um, uh, explained in some other way um, by, say, having a, a whole lot of uh, planets uh, in that location, or a whole lot of uh, well, you could have. You know, that's a very good question, and you could have it, it. It's the mass is is comparable to some of the masses of these little dwarf galaxies that we see orbiting the the Milky Way, and what we found is that. Um, I'll think about how this, how this is properly. If it had 
for the mass that it had, if it had the expected luminosity based on the galaxy sub, uh, dwarf galaxies of, of the Milky Way, dwarf satellites of the Milky Way, then we would not have been able to see it um, because it's, it's below our detection limit. It's too faint for us to see. That galaxy is at almost redshift one, so it's quite far away. We would not have been able to see it. So it could easily, I mean, we did not require the light to be able to see it. In fact, we couldn't have seen the light. Um, we, don't, we can't say that it is purely dark. It's just darker than our, our detection limit. Um, and so in some senses, the, the proof is that we're detecting it even without the, seeing the light, but um, we don't have any interesting constraints on the same mass to light ratio. And so we expect it, it's a little dwarf galaxy. It, for those of you who know the Milky Way, I think it's between, the mass is between uh, Fornax and Sagittarius, those two dwarfs. Um, and so, you know, it could be very well a, a little dwarf galaxy like that. And I mean, so it's not, we found the dark matter clump, but um, we found a clump and we could have found it even if it were dark. And the fact that you've just found one before I hand off the mic, um, is that already telling you something about the statistics, the power law that you... Yes, it's telling us something, but the errors are very large at this point. The, thing, the nice thing is that the simulations say, okay, once we look at 20 lenses, we expect to see, given our detection sensitivity to the mass, we would expect to see, okay, and I'm just picking a number out of a hat for illustration purposes, five of these substructures. And if we see zero, that's actually interesting. That tells us something. Uh, if we see 15, that's also interesting. It tells us something. Um, and so a non-detection is actually um, as useful as a detection in these cases. You know, seeing one when we've looked at one, it, you know, the, the, the small number of statistics, so we can't say anything interesting yet. So entering the phase of precision. Yes, we're entering the phase of precision, yes. Uh, please, a question, uh, gravitational lensing question 101. You look out there with any kind of telescope, you see lots of points of light. But how do you determine certain clumps are from gravitational lensing and not? And then how many gravitational lenses do we know of right now? Okay. Um, so I'll answer that in sort of in reverse order. So we, right now we know about two or 300 lenses, um, sort of galaxy scale lenses. Um, and in the old days, way back in the 80s, uh, the, uh, it, there was a lot of worry about, um, you know, is this thing a lens or not? There's certain configurations, like the, the one that I showed you from my favorite lens with the two images up and then two down here. That's just a totally standard lensing configuration. And so if you see that, you're pretty sure it's a lens. Um, you can measure the spectra of the individual components, and if they're the same, that's a good clue. Um, but nowadays, it's much less controversial that, that um, um, whether things are lenses or not. I mean, the, the test is, well, first of all, if you can do spectroscopy, et cetera, that's, that's useful. Um, if you can make a, a simple model that will reproduce the positions of those images without you know, putting all sorts of bells and whistles on it, that's a really good test. And um, for the one that I showed you, my favorite lens, we discovered that in the radio. We looked at uh, what are called flat spectrum radio sources. Um, these are very rare on the sky. And to find four of them within you know, two arc seconds of each other in that configuration, this sort of says lens immediately. Um, but there was a lot of follow-up. We actually had a fair number of false positives because most of them were doubles. And some of those, looking at the radio, that was what we call a quarter jet with a hot spot. Um, and so there was a lot of follow-up. But um, yeah. So going back to your discussion of the test of Einstein with the, with the solar eclipse. Yes. So now that's almost 100 years, years old. Has technology improved enough to, to now be able to use the sun as a lens if you, if, if you had a, a, with adaptive optics or, or something in space? Um, I mean, people do have made this measurement um, in, um, with the sun. I think they've also used Jupiter. Um, but I, the thing is the sun doesn't, the sun will move things um, by this sort of one point whatever arc seconds. Um, but the sun, you know, being um, 30 arc minutes across, you're not going to see double imaging um, with the sun, it's, it's sort of too close. The distances, there's this distance ratio that goes in, into things. And so um, people are using um, sort of, you know, lensing within the solar system to put uh, tests on general relativity um, and, and sort of doing, you know, can we place things on these sort of non-Einstein parameters of general relativity? And right now, um, 
as far as, as I know, um, all of the sort of higher precision tests that people have done are perfectly consistent with general relativity. Um, but they are using it, um, not sort of this multiple imaging stuff that I'm doing, but they, they um, are using solar system objects. We're, we're, too close to we're too close to the sun. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, a new telescope with the letters TMT. Can yes. you tell us again what that stands for? It, it's the 30-meter telescope, and this is a, pro a proposal that UC, Caltech, Canada, um, perhaps China, India, and Japan are all uh, putting in. Um, it's sort of, it's going to be a segmented mirror like Keck, um, and the two main competing projects, um, there's something called the GMT, the Giant Magellan Telescope, that's uh, led by Carnegie Harvard, um, which is a sort of seven, eight meter mirror design, sort of one in the center and six around the outside. And then the Europeans are putting together something called the EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope, uh, which is going to be 42 meters across. Um, yeah. For the Snickerers, I, if you follow this, the Europeans were originally proposing what they called the OWL telescope, the overwhelmingly large telescope, <laughs> uh, which is 100 meters across, which they claimed they could build for the same amount as, as a TMT, but they've scaled it down. Um, it's almost guaranteed that whatever the European telescope is, it's going to be bigger than the biggest telescope that the Americans put out, because they were really burned by Keck, and so they don't want that to happen again. <laughs> okay, yeah. then. Uh, this is a uh, uh, precision cosmology speculative question. I like speculative questions. And the, lately, cosmology has been reminding me of like the end of the Ptolemaic uh, paradigm. Like there's all this unexplained stuff. Oh, well, we had this measurements are kind of weird. We're going to invent dark matter, and that makes everything look good. Oh, and this is mysterious acceleration. We're going to invent dark energy, and that makes everything look good. And with more and more precision measurements, you can look at this stuff. So my question is, do you anticipate either some third or fourth dark thing that we're going to have to throw in to explain stuff, or uh, with precision measurement, uh, some way of uh, combining it into a new paradigm that's simpler? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't. Uh, speculatively, um, it seems to me I mean, the two things explain sort of different phenomena. I mean, dark matter is it's unsatisfying at one level, but um, I find it more satisfying than the competing theories. It's relatively simple. Okay, you postulate some particle that's distributed and that interacts gravitationally. Dark energy is a real mishmash, and it seems to me the way it's going now, well, either will confirm that it's the cosmological constant that Einstein just threw in, and then, okay. Um, Maybe that's boring. Um, or, I mean, it seems to me, from um, speaking to my theorist friends, is that they keep on adding different things. So it used to be, we're just going to measure this W parameter. That was the big holy grail. And now everyone's talking about, OK, let's look at the change of W with time. So what they call W prime or W A, which is sort of the first derivative. And so you can, you know, we don't understand at all what, what, what the dark energy is. They parameterize this with a simple polynomial expression. And they can always add more terms. Um, and so for the short-term future, that's my guess of what will go is as we get better measurements, they may just sort of continuing adding sort of terms to the dark energy stuff. Um, and it may get to some point where there, it, it gets sort of to be, OK, like the epicycles. I mean, this is just way too complex. We need to shift our way of looking at it and, and uh, come up with something simpler. But for right now, I mean, if you can parameterize it by like two or three parameters, it's not that complicated. So. Um, yeah. I, I guess that, that probably would have been the question to end. Maybe the editors can move it towards the end okay. of the day. <laughs> but this is going back to the very beginning. In terms of, in terms of the time variation and amplitude, mm -hmm. what, 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 do you have uh, causes for that? Because so, it, it, it's got to be the source, not yes, the path. That's exactly right. So, um, and actually, I mean, I didn't even go into this. Um, there's there's multiple sources of the variability. Um, what we care about is this, what's going on in the source, because that variability should be reproduced in all of the light curves, and then you can do this cross-correlation or whatever technique you, you use. Right, and they go along the different paths. And that's due to, I, when you look at active galactic nuclei, they have all this sort of random fluctuation, whether it's changes in the accretion rates, um, 
or in the radio, like they're launching things out and they get shocked and they get much brighter. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's sort of what's going on. It's just, I mean, it's no, people have looked at, at just regular unlensed active black light a lot and they just, they tend to sort of flicker. Um, and that's the signal that we're trying to pick up. It turns out if you look in the optical and x-ray, um, the emission from the source is affected not just by the overall galaxy, but by the stars in the lensing galaxy itself. And those stars are moving around, and they can change the fluxes on time scales of days or weeks. This is called microlensing, and it makes the signal much harder to measure because it can mimic this, what we call the intrinsic, the source-based variability, if you don't look for long enough. Um, and I think the way to get around that in, in the optical is, um, and this is one of the things that we're, we're planning for LSST, is you just, if you monitor for 10 years, um, you know, the microlensing affects just one lens, one image, um, only one image, because it depends on what the stars are doing in front of that image as it passes through the lensing galaxy. And so they're uncorrelated. And so with a long enough time stream, those sort of all wash out, and what's left is just the intrinsic variability. But um, it is complicated if you want to look at it for a year or two. Um, but yeah. Um, it seems like you're looking for with radio and optical that you'd be able to rule out some theories of quantum gravity and you could use each lensing source as a control group because uh, you know the signal will be achromatic, right? The Unless signal, is, quantum signal is achromatic, yes. Um, and as far, uh, well, the problem is that as light if the light is coming from the same exact part of the background object, then the lensing is purely achromatic. But it turns out that, um, you know, a lot of times when we look at, at, you know, in detail at, say, like these active black nuclei, the radio emission is coming from a larger region than the optical, than the x-ray, and therefore the light is not being lensed in exactly the same way. So it's, it's very complicated. You, you, you take this beautiful sort of theoretical experiment and you add in messy astrophysics and try to understand the accretion disks of, around, uh, you know, supermassive black holes. And so that's what makes this it's a hard thing to do. Okay. I, Chris, I have an appropriately colored um, test object for you. Oh. <laughs> you might want to fill it with something heavy and yes. use it in your lab. All right. But, Thank you. <laughs> please join me in thanking Chris.